we actually originally met in Chicago at a house party. But at that time, we did not know our fates would be intertwined. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe a year later or so, I moved from Chicago to San Francisco, left my job in trading and was looking again for the crypto space. Will was living in, in the Bay Area, you know, just hung out with him a bunch and, well, you could, you could tell the rest of the story. Yeah, so a similar kind of situation, fell in love with Ethereum and basically lost interest in everything else. I mean, I feel like there is a few things that kind of led to the idea for Zero X. Initially was developing a way of creating ERC-20 tokens that represent options. So you could essentially create these options on any other ERC-20 token. And so kind of built out like the smart contract system, and it became clear really quickly that ERC-20 tokens aren't very useful if there's nowhere to trade them. And there was no way that these like options tokens would be able to be supported by a centralized exchange. There weren't decentralized exchanges at the time. We decided to build our own decentralized exchange using what we felt was like an improvement over the status quo in terms of how a decentralized exchange could be designed, where orders are created and cryptographically signed off chain and then ultimately settled on chain. So it's much more efficient. So from there, we pretty much had a proof of concept built out. Back in those days, there were, there were a lot of early Ethereum builders in San Francisco. Yeah, I remember like Joey Krug from Augur, uh, Martin Copeland from Gnosis. I think we were talking to people from MakerDAO as well. And like, you know, they all had tokens associated with their protocols. And we discovered they were all planning on basically building their own decentralized exchanges. We were just like in a room whiteboarding and stuff and just randomly came up with the idea to create a decentralized exchange protocol to build this void in the market. And most of those teams that we were talking to needed, uh, a, you know, a DEX, like they were actually pretty interested in, in working with us. Xerox went through a lot of changes over time. So we're basically just trying to replicate TradFi in the context of a decentralized exchange, right? Like order books were pretty much all we knew at the time. We ended up launching Xerox Protocol V1, same time that we uh, did a token sale, uh, it was in August, 2017. The protocol was entirely live then. We were, we were actually probably like one of the first protocols on Ethereum to go live, period. I think at some point, yeah, we, we must have had like 40 different DEXs building on top of us. Like we literally just could not uh, keep up with it. Then the bear market hit in 2018. The demand to trade all these tokens shrunk really quickly. We decided to try to find the liquidity and we were talking to lots of different market makers and trying to onboard them. They we were generally very hesitant to dip their toes into DEXs, didn't really understand the space or the regulatory environment yet. We were able to get a few and build a decent amount of liquidity, um, but in parallel, the space was kind of moving forward and there were other DEXs that were gaining in popularity. You didn't need to necessarily rely on a single DEX for liquidity. You had all these composable smart contracts that you could just tie together to give the user uh, a better experience. We decided to pivot a bit into DEX aggregation in order to take advantage of that the, the ocean of liquidity that was out there. Yeah, I mean, that really was like the core thesis from the very beginning. Like you can create ERC-20 tokens that represent anything. It's just an abstraction. It seemed pretty clear that all forms of value would end up tokenized on public blockchains like Ethereum. I think we both had very strong conviction that there'd be billions of tokenized assets, stocks, bonds, fiat currencies, startup equity, video game items, Items, airline miles, pretty much anything that can be assigned value is going to end up moving onto these globally accessible low friction rails. I think the tokenization thesis has played out amazingly. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, I don't, tokenization is, is uh, accelerating. We're starting to see the economy impacted at like a global scale because of, of crypto and tokenization. Crypto is very cyclical. I feel like in every up part of the cycle, there's kind of like a new type of token that gets really popular, right? Like in you know, 2017, it was all these 
ICOs and protocol tokens, essentially. Around 2020, beginning of DeFi summer, first started out with like all these basically toys, like food tokens was, was the theme at the time. But then, yeah, it became a lot more like uh, DeFi tokens, governance tokens, things like that. Then NFTs were kind of the next boom. You know, now we have like RWAs and meme coins are very big, but you know, I think there are a lot of sub communities in, in meme coins as well. Yeah, we've really just been seeing the tokenization pieces play out in real time over the years. We had been working at all the way at the bottom of the tech stack. So when we first started, we were purely focused on writing open source smart contracts uh, that anyone could plug into and building some of the developer tools around those smart contracts. And over time, as the technology started to mature, it kind of became clear that to build something that users truly want, you really need to start working your way up the stack. What that meant for us is going from just providing these smart contracts to creating a hosted API that allows developers to embed on-chain swaps into their app. This kind of trend of building at the lowest layers of the stack and then gradually working our way up to better serve customers. Ultimately, I think that is what drove us to create Matcha as well, because we've been building this Dex aggregation API. We think it has tons of potential, but what's the best way to understand how to improve it? Also, we just wanted to kind of raise the bar of products in the space. You know, I think they were pretty immature at the time. There weren't very good DEXs out there. Like I said, there were a lot of DEXs building on top of our protocol in the early days, but most of them died out during the bear market or pivoted. And we just, yeah, weren't weren't really happy with, with what we were seeing. So, you know, we have this amazing team and all, all the skills necessary needed to, to build it. And yeah, I think when we launched Matcha, it was like by far the, the best decks out there. And I think if you look at DEXs today, like so many of them basically imitated Matcha's, uh, Matcha's user experience and, and design, which I guess is uh, one of the best compliments we could get. <laughs> the advice I would give to somebody starting a product would be to mostly focus on, on the product and the customer need before trying to add speculation or a token or anything like that. I feel like when markets get really frothy, the temptation to launch a token is really high. I don't think that's uh, what ultimately ends up being valuable for users. And uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on creating enduring value for our customers. And I think it's why we've been able to create great products that, that people use and why we've you know stood the test of time as, as a business. Try and have customers pay as early as you can, because that's the ultimate test of product market fit. If someone's willing to pay to use your product, then it's delivering some value. Have a really strong mission, have a really strong set of values and build your team around that. Maintain the culture. It's really hard to build a team that can stay focused on you know, a single objective or a single North Star over multiple years. And it requires uh, folks that are like bought in and understand the long-term potential of the tech. So be very careful about who you bring into a team and, and make sure you have folks that are long-term aligned. I would add one more thing for anyone considering building a product. There is a lot of free or very cheap infrastructure out there in this space. Things that are on-chain, smart contracts that are just open and permissionless to access, um, they're composable with each other. That's how we were able to build a DEX aggregator. We were essentially taking advantage of all of this other liquidity created by, by other teams, right? And using that to, to benefit our customers. But there's also a lot of open source tooling out there. Um, things that you can fork and use as a starting point. I think that makes it like relatively easy to get something off the ground and just focus in more on your core competencies and like what, what matters to your customers instead of like trying to rebuild or re reinvent the wheel.